A second common Christian teaching is implied in the doctrine of the Trinity. That is the doctrine or the teaching of the complete, full divinity of Jesus Christ. John Wesley lived and Charles Wesley lived in an age when modern Unitarianism was beginning. They called it Socinianism in their day. It was the idea that Jesus was a really, 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 really nice guy, but not God. And that the rumor that Jesus Christ was God was something that developed later historically and was written back into the scriptures. And if you want to find the true Jesus, you find the stuff that portrays him as a very nice 18th century kind of guy. And you remove the stuff about uh, miraculous healings and uh, they fell down and worship him and he is the image of the invisible God. All of that kind of stuff you can take out as being later. Uh, that point of view was becoming very controversial from the 1690s. John and Charles Wesley are both concerned to refute that point of view and to emphasize the divinity of Jesus Christ. There's nothing particularly remarkable or distinctively Methodist about that. We worship Jesus Christ. We sing hymns of praise to Jesus Christ. Third, though, is the doctrine of the atonement. John Wesley says that this is a, a necessary Christian doctrine, at least in one of his private letters to a woman named Mary Bishop in 1778. He says that's a necessary doctrine. In his letter to a Roman Catholic, where he really tries to explain what is common to Catholics and Protestants together, he again refers to the teaching about the atonement that God has worked in Jesus Christ. He uses a lot of traditional Protestant language about substitutionary atonement. That is to say, Christ's death was a substitution for the death that all human beings owe because of our complicity in sin. And yet, John Wesley and Charles Wesley speak and write and sing about the entire life of Christ as Christ's offering to God, or better put, I would say, God's self-offering on our behalf. And that implies that, God, uh, that Jesus Christ was not partially a human being, not simply um, a mass of human flesh inhabited entirely by uh, a deity, uh, but a true human being with a true human body and a true human soul. He was born of a woman. He uh, grew as a child. He grew in stature and knowledge. Uh, he suffered. He wept at the death of a friend. He suffered eventually and died, as every human being must do. One of the answers to the question, why did Jesus Christ have to die, is because he was a full, true human being, and human beings die. And he was raised from the dead on the third day. So I would say there's a sense in which, for John and Charles Wesley, the entire work of Christ, uh, Christ's eternal being, Christ's incarnation in the Blessed Virgin, Christ's birth, Christ's uh, growth, Christ's teachings, Christ's miracles, Christ's suffering and death and resurrection were all part of that preeminent offering that God made on our behalf. And we celebrate the entire life of Christ. One of the ways Charles Wesley did that was in a series of small books of hymns designed for the seasons of the Christian year. Uh, so hymns upon our Lord's uh, nativity, uh, hymns on the ascension, hymns on the resurrection, hymns for what they called Whitsunday or the, the Pentecost Sunday, the coming of the Holy Spirit. So that's a third uh, common Christian teaching, the doctrine of the atonement, which I would say involves all of the human and divine work of Jesus Christ. A fourth doctrine that's common to Christians is the doctrine of biblical authority. John Wesley sometimes spoke in his time as if that was a distinctively Protestant teaching. Protestants in his age liked to point to the writings of the Council of Trent where Catholic teachers said that uh, Christian teachings and practices needed to be grounded in scripture and 
tradition, uh, et scriptura, et traditione, was sometimes taken to mean that they believed these were equal authorities. That's contested in modern Catholic thought, uh, modern Catholic catechisms, and so forth. Whether it is or not, John Wesley understood that he stood in a long line of Christians who believed that the canonical scriptures of the Old as well as the New Testament stand as the final authority for Christian teachings and practices, especially teachings about our salvation and uh, our teachings about uh, how to go about the reform of the church. He could use terms like inerrancy, infallibility. Methodists don't like to mention that sometimes. Uh, he believed that the scriptures do not err and they do not fail when they teach us about the way of salvation uh, and when they teach us uh, what we need to know for the reform of the church. Uh, maybe not quite inerrancy and infallibility in the way in which Protestant fundamentalists came to uh, explain that in the 1800s. That is to say, the scriptures never fail in any matter of history or science and so forth. Mm, John Wesley's first note on the first verse of the first book of the New Testament uh, is an interesting note on Matthew 1.1 1, 1, uh, that says, uh, even if there are errors in the genealogical tables given in Matthew, they are not the fault of the evangelist, but they are errors that were there in the Jewish tables that John Wesley had received, which I think is his way of saying there might be errors in the historicity of certain very specific parts of the scriptures, but you can't attribute that uh, to the work of the evangelists and those who were inspired to write the scriptures. Which brings up the subject of the United Methodist Quadrilateral. Notice how I said that. In 1972, the United Methodist Church adopted a doctrinal statement that said that United Methodist test teachings, especially new controversial teachings, by four tests, by scripture, tradition, experience, and reason. The United Methodist Church never made the claim that those were to be attributed to John Wesley. They did not call it the Wesleyan quadrilateral and have never formally done so. But one really interesting thing was that immediately after the adoption of that statement at the 1972 General Conference in Atlanta, Georgia, a lot of Methodist people began to write that back into John Wesley and say it was John Wesley who taught scripture, tradition, experience, and reason. I was the historian who wrote the first article saying that's not there in John Wesley. Albert Outler came out with an article on the quadrilateral in Wesley. He had a certain logic to what he said. He said in one place John Wesley refers to scripture, experience and Christian antiquity, and he said Christian antiquity is part of what we would call tradition. In another place, uh, John Wesley refers to scripture, experience, and reason. So he thought that if you put those things together, you would come up with something like a quadrilateral of scripture, experience, tradition, and reason. reason why I think uh, that the quadrilateral is not there in John Wesley himself is because he didn't have a conception of tradition as we have come to think about it since the 1800s, where we've come to think of tradition as the work of the Holy Spirit through the long history of the Christian church. John Wesley valued early Christianity and the period especially before Constantine. He valued the period of the Elizabethan Reformation, that period of the uh, English Reformation, uh, but didn't have this kind of sense of, uh, you, uh, of continuous history throughout the centuries. And as a matter of fact, the word tradition was very negatively weighted in his time, was not a positive word. One of the homilies of the Church of England says, we need to go to the well of life in the Holy Scriptures for our salvation and not run to the stinking puddles of men's traditions devised by men's imagination for our salvation. Uh, I think that says the word tradition itself was very negatively weighted in John Wesley's time and he didn't have a sense of tradition 
like the United Methodist Church does have in speaking of tradition in the United Methodist quadrilateral. Uh, nevertheless, there is a strong sense of biblical primacy. The, the Bible has the first place of authority in the church over other uh, authorities, uh, and it is the primary authority for our faith uh, and for our life together. That's borne out in subsequent Methodist doctrinal statements and in subsequent Methodist theological writings.